Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. This video is going to be a bit longer than my typical video because I'm going to be going through a report that's 47 pages long. I've talked about the Batmobile case out of California a couple times. And you recall that a guy in Indiana makes licensed replicas of the cool Batmobile from the TV series. And uh, somehow, for some weird reason, uh, police officers from California went to Indiana uh, and searched his shop and then arrested him and said they were going to drag him back to California for prosecution. And then, of course, the whole thing fell apart when uh, the news started poking around and asking questions about why this was happening. And after people looked at the facts a little more closely, the charges were dismissed and then kind of like it fizzled and went away. So there was enough public outrage about this event that the county of San Mateo, the board that runs that place asked for an investigation into the actions of the various people in California to figure out why they did this. Why did they send four people on the taxpayer's dime, so to speak, to Indiana for a few days when it looks like no crime was committed? And it should have been obvious to those who were involved that no crime had been committed. So I have in my hands the confidential report, and, and it's no longer confidential. It, it has been released by the board. Uh, so what happened was the board asked a retired judge to step in and investigate to figure out what happened. So I'm going to put a link to a PDF of the report in the description of the video below. If you want to take a look at it, feel free to do so. It is no longer confidential. So here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to go through the report and try to point out the things that struck my eye. Okay, The stuff that occurred to me. So for instance, it starts off by saying the county San Mateo through the county attorney, retained a retired judge to conduct an independent investigation into facts surrounding the decision by the sheriff to order an investigation into a complaint of fraud in connection with the purchase of a replica Batmobile and the district attorney's decision to file a felony complaint after declining to do so a year earlier. So the complainant, who I'll refer to as the buyer, I'm going to refer to him as the buyer because that's going to save me a bunch of time because his name is about this long. Uh, the complainant, who's the buyer, called then the sheriff, Carlos Bolanos, and alleged that he'd been the victim of fraud because Mark Rakup accepted payment for a contract to build a replica Batmobile but did not deliver the car. And you'll recall this sheriff is the one who was outgoing. He's no longer the sheriff there. So... The sheriff ordered an investigation into the complaint that resulted in four deputies going to Indiana to arrest Rakeup and extradite him to California for prosecution. They also searched his shop and they also froze his bank account. After declining to do so a year earlier, the district attorney then filed a complaint alleging two counts of felony fraud. So somehow there was this about face by the district attorney. How did that happen? Let's, let's figure this out. So the scope of investigation, based upon the ensuing publicity and public concern over the decision to pursue the investigation, this author was asked to conduct interviews of the parties involved and to create an act, accurate factual record of these decisions. Pursuant to the California Constitution, the California Attorney General has authority to exercise direct supervision authority over the state's county sheriffs and district attorneys in matters pertaining to the duties of their respective offices. However, the county seeks to gather all possible information with respect to the above reference matter without infringing upon that authority. So this judge then was invited to share her observations and make recommendations for best practices and policy consideration. So basically it's, I investigated and I'm going to give you my recommendations based on what we learned here. So her methodology uh, was that she conducted interviews and then reviewed documents. It's important to understand here, though, that the author informed the interviewees of the investigation and notified them that the participation was strictly voluntary. So she wasn't going to subpoena anybody or threaten anybody, and her authority was simply to do an investigation. So she said it's voluntary. There were two people that she references who declined to speak to her. Two. One of them worked for the district attorney's office, and one of them was the buyer of the car. So... I will let you make any decisions or conclusions you want to draw from that because I do think that is telling. So here is a summary of the facts. In August of 2021, the buyer, 
who is a San Mateo County businessman and resident of Atherton, filed with the Atherton Police Department a complaint claiming he was defrauded by Mark Rakeup, who's the guy who makes the cars. He runs a company called Fiberglass Freaks. The amount of the car purchase was $210,000 and was for the purchase of a replica 1966 Batmobile. The buyer alleged he wired the money to rake up between January of 2017 and August of 2020, but did not receive the car as promised. Now, rake up is the only person licensed by DC Comics to build and sell replica Batmobiles, which he does at his business, Fiberglass Freaks, in Logansport, Indiana. Then she goes into how the cars are built, how long it takes. They take 3,000 hours to build. It can often take longer depending on the weather, believe it or not, because of heat and humidity can affect how the fiberglass is made. So on January 1st, 2017, Rakeup and the buyer entered into a contract for the purchase of a replica Batmobile. The buyer paid a $40,000 down payment and agreed to make payments when certain production benchmarks were met. So you buy the car, but you pay for the build as it goes. The estimated date of completion was 2018. However, extensions due to labor actions, delay of parts, or acts of God were built into the contract. And of course, COVID came along during this as well. What is not mentioned in the contract is the buyer wasn't sold a specific car, but a place in the delivery queue, which would eventually result in him receiving title to a car but only after it was built and assigned a vehicle identification number. So he was assigned number 29. And that's important because there was no specific car. And when you have a contract for the purchase of something, the question is, does the purchase contract contain identifiers that will actually say you get this specific widget versus this specific widget? And if it's not identifiable like that, then it changes some of the obligations of the parties under the contract. So this meant that the buyer was 29th in line to receive a completed car. Uh, And she explains how this happens and how this works on that. So in December of 2019, Rakeup asked the buyer to make a $20,000 payment, which was required by the contract, when the car is ready for its first coat of primer. So when there's a car ready for its first coat of primer, if that's the car that's been assigned to you, then you make the payment for that benchmark. Um, Meanwhile, the buyer had already made payments totaling $170,000, but according to Rakeup, before he requested the $20,000 payment, the buyer had not been concerned by Rakeup's failure to complete the car per the contract, telling Rakeup take as much time as he needed. The buyer said he would make the payment but he did not. And that's where the problem appears to have begun. So around this time, there was email correspondence suggesting that the buyer had been inquiring about the progress of his car and was anxious about the delays. And Rakeup informed him that production of his car had been suspended due to non-payment. He warned the buyer he would not resume working on the car until the buyer made a payment. So in 2020, the buyer wired to rake up $40,000, which represented the remaining balance of the contract. Now, the car was still not completed at that point. The buyer then went to the Atherton Police Department and reported that he'd been a victim of fraud. The Atherton Police Department took his statement and investigated the case. They contacted the Logansport Police Department for information about rake up. They Googled his business, contacted a customer who had sued rake up over the sale of a replica Batmobile, They spoke to Rakeup's brother, who is an attorney, who stated that Rakeup and the buyer had a business dispute about payment for the car, which was the cause of the delay. After the Atherton Police Department completed its investigation, the final report was sent to San Mateo County District Attorney's Office, who declined to file a criminal complaint. So they had everything in front of them, and they said, we're not going to do it. So then the buyer filed a lawsuit in the San Mateo Superior Court, a civil lawsuit against Rakeup alleging fraud. The civil complaint was dismissed because the court determined that it would be better handled by a court in Indiana. That was the proper venue for resolution of the dispute. So he's filed a criminal complaint, non-starter. Filed the lawsuit, dismissed. Thereafter, in late 2021, the buyer directly called San Mateo County Sheriff Carlos Bolanos and made the same complaint of fraud. It was the same thing he said earlier to the police department, same thing he said in his civil lawsuit. Now he's saying it to the sheriff. 
He went to the sheriff because he thought the case was complex and exceeded the expertise of the Atherton Police Department. But keep in mind that the buyer never spoke to the investigator here. So presumably, she's getting this information from the sheriff. The sheriff took the buyer's call because he's acquainted with him. The buyer is a local business person and a friend of the sheriff's brother. So the sheriff then referred the complaint to a man named Leishman, who is head of the sheriff's vehicle theft task force, and asked him to follow up with the buyer. The sheriff does not recall whether he knew the district attorney's office had already declined to prosecute the case when he referred the case to Leishman. And he said that Leishman was not given any particular instructions on the scope or limitations of the investigation. So Leishman started poking around, doing some research, and somewhere along the line, after reviewing documents provided by the buyer's investigator, because the buyer had apparently gotten a private investigator on this, Leishman thought, and here's the quote, if he wrote some affidavits and looked into email communication, the facts would support criminal fraud. So somehow he's thinking that if he writes an affidavit, that that'll help the case. (laughs) And if he looks into email communication, the facts would support criminal fraud. But it sounds like he's suggesting that at that moment in time, they wouldn't unless he wrote some affidavits and found something in the email. But he focused his investigation on the wire transfer of $40,000 made in August of 2020 and payments made at the same time by another customer named Danny Glasser. This is important because Leishman believed that a car had been delivered and he thought that the buyer's car had been delivered to this guy, Glasser. And so Leishman began operating on a false assumption. Because he thought, and this is spelled out over 47 pages, that what had happened was that Rakeup had finished the car and that he had then called the buyer and said, if you want your car, you got to pay $40,000, which is not what happened, by the way. But the man wires the $40,000 but doesn't get his car, and Leishman believes that the car was then given to another buyer, Glasser, And therefore, it was fraud when Rakeup said, give me $40,000 and you can have your car, and then sold the car to somebody else. That's not what happened, but that is apparently what Leishman thought happened. Leishman was aware that the San Mateo County District Attorney's Office had declined to prosecute the case earlier that year, but he believed that he had additional information, and that it was his job to get the bottom of the case. He then called Deputy District Attorney Marie McLaughlin, who had been earlier assigned to the case. I mention her because she's the one who declined to participate in this investigation. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've never been a district attorney, but if I was, and I was being investigated by a retired judge at the behest of the people in government who oversee my work, uh, I would tell the people beneath me, cooperate with the investigator. And if you don't feel like cooperating, quit. Because part of your job is to do your job, And if you're doing your job right, you've got nothing to hide. So you should cooperate with this investigation. When you don't cooperate, it makes it look like you might be hiding something or you aren't too proud of what you've done. That's just the way I read that. And I think most people read it that way too. So he called Deputy District Attorney Marie McLaughlin, who had been earlier assigned to the case, but he does not recall the specifics of the conversation. But they decided that Leishman would coordinate his investigation with the district attorney's office, apparently through McLaughlin. So Leishman says he wouldn't have proceeded further with the investigation had he been discouraged from doing so, but nobody discouraged him from doing so. So he spent six months working on getting warrants for Rakeup's financial information and for email communication. And this is what he came to the conclusion. He came to the conclusion that the email correspondence between the buyer and Rakeup established that Rakeup had solicited the $20,000 payment, but he believed it was on the representation um, <clears throat> it was on the representation that the buyer's car was in first prime. And in fact, Rakeup wrote the following, quote, I've kept my end of our agreement, your car is in first prime, unquote. The buyer relied on that representation and sent Rakeup $40,000 to balance the contract price. Now, that did happen. That's why it's not wrong, because it actually happened. (laughs) It's exactly how Rakeup presented it. At the same time, 
Rakup was in a dialogue with another buyer, Glasser, about purchasing a car. On July 27th, Rakup approached Glasser and told him about a customer who may not be able to complete the purchase of his car and asked Glasser if he's interested in taking over that one. And so all he's basically saying is, look, um, you are one behind this guy in line. If you make the payment that he didn't make, I'll move you ahead in line. That's basically all he's saying, okay? So Rakup confirmed that now to the guy, you are taking over car number 29. So he told that to Glasser. Leishman concluded that fraud had been committed when Rakeup accepted payment for car 29 after he confirmed that car 29 was Glasser's. But again, keep in mind, these are not specific cars in that sense. It's simply your place in line as the cars get built. During the investigation, Leishman periodically updated the sheriff uh, on the progress of the case. So on July 19th, 2022, McLaughlin filed a felony complaint alleging one count violation, penal code section 532, obtaining money by false pretenses, and a violation of penal code section 484, diversion of construction funds. And I pointed out earlier in previous videos that the diversion of construction funds most likely is referring to construction. And I know some people say, Steve, uh, you know in Europe they refer to car builders as constructors. Yeah, this isn't happening in Europe, my friend. This is happening in America. Trust me, <laughs> Indiana. We do not car call, call car builders constructors. So neither District Attorney uh, Wagstaff nor Chief Deputy District Attorney Sean Gallagher were aware of the decision to file the complaint. Nothing about the case uh, raised red flags to the people who were aware of it. Now here's the question. Uh, those two people not being aware of the decision to file a complaint, was the decision to file a complaint made by McLaughlin? I'd like to know the answer to that question, but she didn't speak to the investigator, so we don't know. Once he obtained the warrants and the complaint, Leishman organized a trip to Indiana. He lined up three deputies to accompany him, and so four people went to Indiana. They flew there, rented a car, uh, and when asked his thoughts on the propriety of four deputies going to Indiana, the sheriff responded that seeking the warrants and the trip to Indiana was Leishman's decision, and it was not the sheriff's place to micromanage. So the sheriff says, hey, look, I, I let them do their own work. That, that's what they do. So they showed up at uh, Rakeup's shop in Indiana, and um, this whole thing is quite detailed. But Leishman introduced himself to Rakeup and explained why he was there. He led the search and was the only person from the delegation to actually address Rakeup directly. Rakeup's lawyer was informed of the search and called Leishman. Leishman informed Rakeup's lawyer they were there to search the premises, but would not interview Rakeup. According to Rakeup, Leishman refused to allow Rakeup to talk to his own lawyer, which upset him. Rakeup was not interviewed at that time, but Leishman reported that he did talk nervously throughout the search. Rakeup offered to show Leishman car number 28, but there were five or six cars in the premises, all in the early stages of production. Rakeup told Leishman that any of those cars could be number 28. Leishman knew the car was fully paid for and was looking for a nearly completed car. He concluded that number 28 did not exist. So there were five or six cars there in various stages of production, but he concluded there was no car. After completing the search, Leishman formally arrested Rakeup and transported him to the Logansport Police Department. And at some point, Rakeup disclosed that he had a heart condition. So once Leishman learned Rakeup had a heart problem, he made a decision not to extradite him. So they took him to the police department and they processed him and then said, you're going to later up, you know, have to show up in California. So after all that happened, Leishman left for vacation. And that's important because the man leaves for vacation. And while he's on vacation, his phone blows up, <laughs> figuratively speaking. While on vacation, Leishman learned his investigation had become the Batmobile case. And everything had blown up because the Bay Area press had gotten involved. District Attorney Wagstaff uh, and Gallagher were involved in considering dismissing the complaint. They requested more information from Leishman. One thing they wanted to know was whether Glasser had in his possession the car that the buyer had paid for. They, le they then learned that neither the buyer nor Glasser were in possession of a car. So it turns out that Leishman was working on a false premise, and that is that the car sold to this guy was delivered to this guy. 
when no car had been delivered yet with respect to these two guys. Meanwhile, a reporter from Channel 7 extensively covered the investigation. The coverage focused on the county agency's decisions to send to Indiana four deputies to arrest a man in a contract dispute with a wealthy San Mateo County businessman. And I'm not going to get too heavily into this because she talks about how that story characterized it and so on. But they do point out that Leishman is the head of the Vehicle Theft Task Force, yet there's no allegation of a vehicle theft in this case. Theoretically, it's fraud involving a vehicle, but that's not vehicle theft. So some people are questioning that. Meanwhile, McLaughlin, who would apparently not speak the investigator, spoke to the press one time. She was asked why criminal charges were filed after the case was rejected the first time it was presented. She replied, additional investigation, period. Detectives were able to obtain search warrants and obtain additional evidence, period. She didn't say what that was, though. The district attorney was contacted for comment but did not know anything about the case. However, once he got involved, he ordered a review of the case to try to understand what happened. Further investigation was conducted, and Wagstaff learned that Glasser did not receive a completed car. He didn't receive a completed car. On September 16th, the complaint was dismissed. So apparently, this entire thing hinged on whether somebody got that car that the buyer thought he was buying. All somebody had to do was answer that one question correctly, and you'd realize there's no case here. But nobody bothered to do that until the DA looked into it after his people had already authorized prosecution, and there had already been this wild goose chase cross-country with the police and so on. So initially, Rakeup was reluctant to speak to the press, but he was eventually interviewed by the press in both California and Indiana. He expressed outrage that law enforcement in California would get involved in a business dispute, particularly a contract centered in Indiana. His bank accounts were frozen for over a month, which caused him to halt operations of his business. And he thought the sheriff's department was carrying out the buyer's threat to run him out of business. And Rakeup said at one point in time that was a threat that had been made to him that he's going to get put out of business because of this. Meanwhile, the sheriff was interviewed by the investigator, and um, the complaint leading to this investigation came to him when he accepted a call directly from the buyer. The sheriff and the buyer are acquainted. Now, the sheriff says they do not socialize. But the buyer told the sheriff that in 2017, he contracted for a Batmobile replica. Car was supposed to be completed in 2018, but he hadn't gotten his car. So the sheriff contacted Leishman, head of the Vehicle Theft Task Force, to follow up with the buyer. The sheriff does not recall whether he knew the district attorney had declined to prosecute the case when he referred the case to his own guy. The sheriff didn't place limits in the scope or resources in the investigation. Leishman occasionally updated the sheriff on this and other investigations, but the sheriff did not expect Leishman to update him on the investigation and did not give him any further direction. The sheriff stated he does not get involved in investigations and leaves them to staff and their immediate supervisors to manage. In July of 2022, shortly before leaving for vacation, Leishman informed the sheriff that he and three deputies were going to Indiana to execute search warrants and extradite rake up to California. Leishman's decision to go did not require prior authorization, and telling the sheriff was informational only. So the sheriff was asked, in hindsight, if he would have done anything differently, and he said no. He would not change the way the investigations are conducted or the approval process for those investigators and how they went about doing their stuff. So she interviewed Lieutenant Michael Leishman, the head of the Criminal Auto Theft Division. Uh, He was interviewed in December of 2022. He's been in law enforcement in San Mateo for about 15 years, started in the police department, served five years in special investigations, before moving to the sheriff's department, where he's been for the last 10 years. His tenure there has included serving as an undercover agent for the Narcotics Task Force and supervisor of the Crime Suppression Unit. He's now commander of the Narcotics Task Force, the Vehicle Theft and Recovery Task Force, and the Gang Intelligence Task Force. So she goes on and on about what she learned from him, But when he began his investigation, Leishman was aware that the district attorney's office had declined to prosecute the case. So he was aware of that. 
He spoke to the deputy district attorney assigned to the case, Marie McLaughlin, who again did not speak to this investigator, in late 2021, but does not recall the specifics of the conversation. Now, if I was investigating this and I wanted to know what that conversation contained, I would speak to people who had the conversation. Leishman is one, and he says he doesn't recall them. Marie McLaughlin is the other, and she didn't speak to the investigator. So I guess we'll never know what was in that conversation. Leishman thought there was more to the case than had been presented to the district attorney's office and thought if he wrote some affidavits and looked into email communication, the facts would support a case against Rakeup. Leishman believed the fraud occurred when the buyer wired $40,000 to rake up and the car built for the buyer was sold to someone else. Boom, right there is the entire problem with his case. Leishman, in his head, thought there was more. And what he thought did not happen. He was thinking of something that had not happened. He thought that fraud occurred when the buyer wired the money to rake up and the car built for the buyer was sold to someone else. So if he wrote some affidavits and looked into some emails, he could prosecute him for that. But there's a big problem there. The car had not been finished and had not been delivered to anyone. So how he got that mistaken belief, we don't know. Because the sentence says, Leishman believed the fraud occurred and previously said, and he thought the facts would support a case. So what he thought and what he believed were apparently baseless. Why did he think those things? Don't know. Don't know. Could be wishful thinking, if nothing else. So, again, this is the investigator's summary of what I just told you. Thus, to Leishman's thinking, the buyer paid for the Batmobile in full, there was a car, and Leishman was tasked to find it. Guess what? He never found that particular car that was sold to somebody else because that hadn't happened. Not in this transaction. Leishman did not interview Rakeup in advance of getting the warrants. He had information about Rakeup's version of events from the buyer's private investigator. So he's going to take information from a private eye, a Rockford kind of guy, and uh, not actually speak to the person at the other end of this transaction and apparently doesn't want to tip him off. I think that's part of it too. Yeah, Leishman did not want to tip Rakeup off about the investigation. So here's where it gets funny. The group goes to Indiana. Undercover cops, right? They flew to Indianapolis and drove an hour and a half to Logansport. Leishman had to obtain the search warrant from the local court, but court resources were scarce, so it took two days. The San Mateo deputies attracted attention. In the local diner, everyone knew who they were and why they were there. Now, I've traveled places before and I've eaten at local restaurants. No one knew who I was or why I was there, unless I told them. So why are four San Mateo law enforcement people in a diner in Logansport, Indiana, telling everyone why they're there? Because that's the only way this got out like that. The San Mateo deputies attracted attention. In the local diner, everyone knew who they were and why they were there. So they went there. They went to the guy's shop. They pulled him aside, wouldn't let him speak to his attorney. Uh, They froze his bank account. They walked through, saw all the cars in process of being built, but they came to the conclusion that the car didn't exist for some weird reason. There were five or six cars on the premises, but were in various stages of production. So after the search was completed, Leishman left a receipt for the items he seized, and they went to the Logansport Police Department, and that's where they decided to book rake up, but not actually drag him to California. And then Leishman says that while he's on vacation, after news reports about what happened, uh, hit his phone started blowing up. Now, the investigator also spoke to Mark Rakeup, and he's 57 years old, resides in Logansport, married for 35 years, been a Batman fan since he was a kid. They go all into that. And the um, author of this article who is investigating this, the retired judge, uh, it's a report, I should call it that, 
And uh, the author of this report does a very nice job of doing this very, very balanced. And she explains quite a bit about, you know, what everyone's various versions of events were. And so as I went through Mark Rakup's description of what happened, it lines up perfect with what everyone else said, except for a couple things. Rakup is the one who points out that when one of the cops called his attorney, they wouldn't let him speak to his attorney right then and there. That's a problem. They also said they were going to freeze a portion of his bank account to protect the money given to him by the buyer. Actually, they froze his entire bank account. Rakeup did not regain access to his bank accounts until August 16th of 2022. Uh, and he said basically that that shut him down and caused him quite a bit of hardship. And Rakeup does talk about that quite a bit. And then the investigator also talked to Chief Deputy District Attorney Sean Gallagher about what happened. And they go on and on there. But the important thing about this is that on August 4th or 5th, in 2022, Gallagher, Wagstaff, McLaughlin, and a senior deputy met to discuss the case. McLaughlin was asked questions about her work on the case and analyzed it from a broader perspective. And then more specifically, they considered how potential jurors might look at the evidence, what the defenses would be offered, and how the trial might play out. At the end of the discussion, McLaughlin was asked to contact Leishman, ask him for additional evidence, and ask him to respond to further questions, such as, was there a car or not delivered to somebody else? Because remember, Leishman thought there was, but he should know by now that there's not. And again, McLaughlin is doing this, and we don't get her version of the story because she didn't speak to the investigator. She declined. Up until this point, it was assumed there was a single car that had been sold to both the buyer and Glasser and that Glasser had it. However, that was not the case. And one of the reasons we know this is the investigator, investi- <laughs> investigator interviewed Glasser, and he said, no, I haven't got a car yet. What are you talking about? Meanwhile, she interviewed District Attorney Stephen Wagstaff, and um, in his narrative, it's pointed out that Gallagher and McLaughlin made 12 separate requests for evidence and answers to questions to find out where the money went, whether there was a completed car, And if so, did that other customer have it? And as they figured these things out, they very quickly realized that this case was falling apart. And so at some point here, after interviewing Wagstaff, Wagstaff told the investigator, the Batmobile case fell into the category of cases that should have remained in civil court. The focus of the warrants and criminal case was the $40,000 transaction, And later on, there was more information, but at its core, the case was a business dispute. So the judge then wraps up this whole sordid 44-page affair and writes a conclusion, which I'll read to you verbatim because, hey, we're here, right? This investigation was prompted by the public's response to decisions made by public officials in San Mateo County and the County Board of Supervisors' desire for an accurate factual record. This report does not contain any legal conclusions or opinions about liability. Liability notwithstanding, examination of facts surrounding the county officials' decisions offers an opportunity to examine their impact on the public's trust and confidence in the officials and the institutions they lead. Consideration should be given to the following. The sheriff's admission that he directly responds to the concerns of people he knows and reroutes the concerns of those he does not, denies equal access and treatment to the San Mateo County public as a whole. The fact that anyone in the county can lodge a complaint with the sheriff's office does not level the playing field. Problem number one, the sheriff appeared to be doing a favor for a friend. The appearance of conflicts of interest is how she labels the next few paragraphs. The facts do not suggest a conflict of interest for either the sheriff or the district attorney. The fact that a company in which the buyer has an interest contributed to both officials' political campaigns gives the appearance of a conflict and suggests favoritism in the treatment of the complaint. Delegating to qualified staff decision-making involving campaign contributors eliminates the appearance of conflict or favoritism. 
screening cases for operational integrity. The sheriff referred this case to Leishman because Leishman is in charge of the Vehicle Theft Task Force, and the complaint allegedly involved a stolen car. However, this case did not fall within the mission of the Vehicle Theft Task Force. The task force focuses on car theft rings, multi-jurisdictional operations, and understanding trends in car thefts. This case would have benefited from an objective assessment before Leishman proceeded with an investigation. Having a process for screening investigations that falls outside the mission of a department or task force might prompt closer scrutiny of the need for the investigation or suggest parameters for the scope of an investigation. There was never a consideration by the sheriff that ordering an investigation of a case that the district attorney declined to prosecute might deserve closer scrutiny than was given here. The case attracted the attention of the press because the buyer is wealthy and the alleged theft was of a replica Batmobile. However, the bare facts are that significant resources of man hours and money were expended to understand a messy contractual relationship compounded by the Byzantine business practices of one of the contractors. Whether the budget of a government department can absorb the cost is immaterial. Ensuring the appropriate expenditure should always be of the highest highest priority. The district attorney's office reviewed the case in depth before deciding to dismiss the complaint. They considered how the jury might view the case, the evidence it would hear, and the likelihood of a conviction. While the amount of evidence available to conduct an evaluation may vary from case to case, the essential facts upon which this case was dismissed were known or could have been known before filing. She's saying they screwed up. They filed charges without knowing everything they should have known or they knew them and chose to ignore those facts. The contract dispute was well documented and whether Rakeup delivered a car just after the buyer made the final payment was knowable. Evaluation of the likelihood of success in trial could have occurred before the complaint was filed. Moreover, a more robust pre-filing review would serve as a dragnet for cases that would benefit from a review at a higher level, such as cases involving extradition for prosecution, felony cases filed after a previous rejection, or felony cases filed after a failed attempt in civil court, which, of course, this would fit all three of those. So prosecutorial discretion, she addresses, it's broad and can only be challenged in limited circumstances. The policies and best practices that apply to this case were in place, but not communicated to the line deputies handling the case. That is the policy that complainants, like the buyer, who choose to resolve their disputes in civil court, cannot avail themselves of the criminal justice system. This can be solved by training deputies to identify this type of conflict and exercise the discernment to either have the case reviewed by executive staff or not file at all. Incorporating community values and instilling trust and confidence in public institutions should always be a high priority. Hindsight always offers a clearer vision of events, however, Alignment and consistency with the community's best interest and its values should be consideration at the outset of all investigations and prosecutions. And then the judge signs it, and that's the end of the report. 47 pages. She spoke to a lot of people, two people noticeably missing. The buyer, that is the complainant, the guy who said I was the victim of a crime. And the other is the uh, deputy district attorney, uh, McLaughlin, who declined to speak. And I'm trying to find... The exact language, here it is. Uh, It's a footnote on page four. Uh, The buyer did not respond to a request for an interview. Marie McLaughlin declined to be interviewed. So, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not a district attorney. I am a lawyer, though. 31 years. And if I was a DA, or I was simply running a team of some sort, legally, And we screwed up this badly. Uh, And somebody said, we're going to have an independent investigation of what you guys did. I would tell people on my staff, you cooperate with that investigation. And if you don't want to cooperate, go go pack your stuff. Because if you did everything on the up and up, you've got nothing to be ashamed of. And if you are scared to explain to somebody what you did in your official capacity, you've also got a problem. And so I'll admit that this footnote actually simply says, 
Marie McLaughlin declined to be interviewed. Now, I suppose it's possible. She may have had, I don't know, a doctor's appointment that morning and said, I can't talk right now. I've got a doctor's appointment. Well, reschedule it. Reschedule your interview. The fact that it says she declined to be interviewed makes it sound like they said, would you like to be interviewed? She said, no. And it does say at the outset, this is a voluntary thing. They were not going to subpoena anybody. They were not going to force anyone to testify. But why don't you speak when you know about something that happened? And I mean, I know people are witnesses to things and say, I don't want to get involved. You're involved at this point. You're involved. So the fact that she was involved and decided not to speak, in my mind, is a problem. But the entire case, and by the way, thank you for being here at this point. <laughs> I have no idea how long this is. My timer ran out so long ago, I forgot. Uh, this entire case boils down to the man in California has a contract with the man in Indiana. Somewhere along the line, they have a dispute. Man in California files a criminal complaint, it's investigated, and they decline to prosecute. He then files a lawsuit in California. Local court in California says this shouldn't be filed here. If you've got a problem, go file it in Indiana. Instead of following that advice, he then calls up the sheriff who takes his phone call and says, hey, and he files another complaint, but the first complaint you see was with the city police department. This is with the county sheriff. So this is what you get, I don't know, the third bite at the apple. And the sheriff then assigns it to somebody. And somewhere along the line, this guy named Leishman comes to the conclusion that there was a car that had been finished. It was owed to the guy in California. And after the guy in Indiana demanded money for it and got the money, he then sold the car to somebody else who took delivery of it. Where that notion came from, we don't know. Now, we do know that he relied partially on information given to him by a private investigator. <laughs> Remember when I mentioned Rockford earlier? So we don't know if that's where that came from, but he was working on a faulty premise. There was not a car that had been promised here but sold here. That hadn't happened. That hadn't happened. And so once they figured that out, they go, oh, we shouldn't have done this. And as the judge points out, that could have been discovered earlier if they'd bothered to try to discover it. And that is their job, to investigate these things, to determine if there's a case. If there is, then you file the complaint and you pursue it. So they got the things slightly out of order here, okay? They did a shoddy investigation. They went to his shop, arrested him, searched his shop, froze his bank account, threatened him with being extradited to California, and then later figured out, oh, there wasn't a car that had been promised here but delivered here. Oh, oh, we'll drop the charges now. Okay, but you realize that if you simply bothered to ask that question at the front end of the whole story, you wouldn't have wasted the time and money of going to Indiana and sitting in a diner saying, hey, everybody, we're here on a top secret mission. We're, 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 we're going to go bust up that fiberglass freak's place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone knew who they were and why they were there. Everyone knew. That's actually my, fav my, my favorite part of this entire story. And I don't, don't get me wrong. This is a bad story. It never should have happened. And by the way, uh, full disclosure, I've spoken to Mark Rakeup. Very nice guy. I've spoken to him. I've not met him. I've spoken to him. And so what happened to him is a shame. Because what most people think, and by the way, in case you didn't figure this out, and I'll, I'll say it for those who haven't figured this out yet, the retired judge who wrote this report was being very kind to the prosecutors and the police. She could have been a little more outspoken, but she balanced it very, very deftly, shall we say. I'm not going to say she balanced it well, because she could have come right out and said, this should not have happened. And so the fact that it did happen then leads you to the question, why did it happen if it shouldn't have happened? And you go, oh, wait a second. We have an outgoing sheriff who appears to have done a favor for a friend who caused something to happen that otherwise would not have happened if people had done their jobs. That's the conclusion I draw from this. And I think that's the conclusion that reasonable people draw from this. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons they dismissed the charges. Because the prosecutors realized they could never get a conviction in this case. Never. Because the defense attorney would have said, you know what happened here? Buyer called in a favor, got this to happen, never would have happened otherwise. 
That is exactly what you get if you read between the lines. I urge you to read this if you're so inclined. It's 47 pages long, but I'll put the link in the description below. And I apologize for this being the longest video in the history of mankind. I'm sure it is. <laughs> but I think it's an important story, and this puts an end to it, hopefully. Questions or comments, put them below. I'll just talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Leto's Law. Yes, I'm a material girl. Check out my fabric collection.